Thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, as I said, this is a webinar being co-hosted by the Law Commission and Garden Court Chambers. Um, there's a few bits of housekeeping for me to share with you at the beginning. You will be have been placed on mute, but you'll have the opportunity to post questions in the Q&A window. Um, the chat function is also enabled for other comments. The, any resources that are shared during the webinar will be circulated to delegates afterwards. And the webinar is being recorded. What that means is the audio and video of the panelists and anyone who speaks, if they are unmuted, will be recorded. And the webinar is going to be shared on our YouTube channel after the event. Please refer to the instructions in the chat window if you are experiencing any technical difficulties. So we are delighted to be co-hosting this event with the Law Commission this afternoon um, and helping them gain uh, the insight of defence practitioners uh, for their intimate image abuse consultation. Garden Court Chambers is committed to fearlessly representing our clients, fighting injustice and upholding the rule of law. And it's a really integral part of our role as publicly funded lawyers to engage in and promote the development of the law. So it's a privilege to be engaging in this discussion. And we are, and the Law Commission this afternoon are particularly interested in uh, gathering the views of defence practitioners. We are going to hear from Professor Penny Lewis, Nadia Mansour, Rosie Peck, all from the Law Commission. And then we're going to go and hear from Tom Wainwright, um, Joanne Cecil and Abigail Beish from Garden Court Chambers. So I'm going to turn first to Professor Penny Lewis. Uh, Professor Penny Lewis is Law Commissioner for Criminal Law. And before law joining the Law Commission, she was Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Centre of Medical Law and Ethics in the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College London. She is member of the Board of Human Tissue Authority and her research covers criminal evidence and cr criminal procedure, focusing on prosecution for historic childhood sexual offences and the law governing corroborative and supporting evidence. She has also published in the, widely in the field of medical law with a particular interest in the relationship between the criminal law and medicine. So she's particularly well equipped to deal with this particular issue. So we're going to turn first to Professor Penny Lewis to give us an introduction to the Law Commission and the, this particular consultation, the structure of the offense of offences um, and the defense of reasonable excuse. Thank you, Penny. Thanks very much, Kate. Uh, and thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, the Law Commission uh, is a consultative organization. And so the way in which we um, recommend law reform is very much by engaging with uh, individuals and organizations to test our proposals and to ensure that we've come up with uh, the best possible recommendations for law reform. Many of you will already know about the Law Commission. We've recently been uh, consulting on projects on hate crime, which is getting a little attention these days, um, harmful online communications and confiscation of the proceeds of crime. Um, uh, but we've been around for really a very long time. We were created in 1965, along with the Law Commission of Scotland, um, by the Law Commissions Act. Uh, and our, our role, according to the statute, is to keep the law of England and Wales under review. So, you know, fairly manageable job. Um, and to recommend reform where it's needed. Uh, and our aim, again, according to the statute, is to ensure that the law is fair, modern, simple, and cost-effective. Um, I'm going to talk to you today, um, next slide, please, uh, about uh, a project that uh, launched uh, its consultation period at the end of last, last month. And this is a project that came out of our 2018 scoping report on abusive and offensive online communications. As part of that uh, review, we were asked, um, following its publication by uh, the Ministry of Justice, to take on a particular aspect of abusive online communications, 
uh, to review the law on the taking, making and sharing of intimate images without consent. Other projects which came out of that review were the, the full hate crime review and uh, the harmful online communications review, which is part of the DCMS online harms work. So you can see that we've got these three projects sort of broadly um, in, in uh, um, overlapping areas. Um, but this one is particularly focused on intimate images. We've, we're running a three month consultation period from now until the 27th of May. Um, it's possible to respond online. Indeed, that's our uh, preference. Um, and you can find the full consultation paper, a much shorter summary. Um, and two different ways of responding online, either to the summary or to the full consultation paper um, at this link. And you're very welcome to sort of mix and match. So if there's some questions from the full paper you'd like to respond to in detail, but the rest of it isn't of so much interest and you'd like to respond uh, in a more summary fashion, that's absolutely fine. Um, we'll be engaging throughout the consultation pe period with individuals and groups with an interest in this area, ranging from operational um, uh, stakeholders to victims, to uh, lawyers, um, and uh, indeed members of the public. Um, and once the consultation period is finished, we'll analyze the responses and then aim to report to parliament with recommendations for reform by the end of 2021. Um, next slide, please. So um, we've spent um, uh, over a year, in fact, developing our provisional uh, proposals. And, and the way in which the Law Commission works is that we um, talk to stakeholders during the pre-consultation period to come up with what we hope are uh, robust provisional proposals that we've refined using a process of getting feedback from stakeholders. Um, and then we put those out to consultation. And the idea is that by actually making proposals, uh, we then uh, get a sort of better quality consultation response. So it's not that we're wedded to these proposals and they will definitely become our final recommendations. Uh, they are certainly uh, what we think are the best options, um, but we're, we're very interested in your views about whether we've got uh, the balance right, uh, whether there are issues we've missed, uh, et cetera. So let me outline the proposed new framework. We're proposing four new offenses, and these would replace the existing upskirting voyeurism and disclosing private sexual images offenses. Um, so there will be a base offense, which has no additional intent element of taking or sharing an intimate image without consent. Two more serious offenses, both of which do have additional intent elements, one uh, intent to humiliate, alarm, or distress, and the other um, intent to obtain sexual gratification. And then there will be a threats offense of threatening to share an intimate image. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about each of these uh, provisionally proposed new offenses. If I could have the next slide, please. So this is, uh, broadly speaking, the base offense. Now, um, this might look like an actual offense in the sense that we've drafted it in the way that offenses are drafted, but um, we're certainly not uh, intending for this to be any kind of finalized drafting. We just find it's easier to sort of set out uh, the elements of an offense if we make some attempt to get them into a form that is familiar to those who uh, gen generally are used to reading uh, offenses uh, in um, a statutory form. We also make considerable efforts to explain in the consultation paper and the summary, the offenses in sort of more lay friendly language. Um, so uh, under the base offense, it would be an offense for a, a defendant intentionally to take or share an intimate image. And my uh, colleague Nadia Manzor, who is um, the lead lawyer on this project will be talking about the definition of an intimate image in a moment. An intimate image of someone else, if that person, the victim does not consent and the defendant does not reasonably believe that the victim consents. And we do uh, spend uh, an entire chapter, indeed developing um, the, uh, the fault element of uh, these offenses and canvas 
options here for the um, element in relation to uh, the defendant's awareness of lack of consent. We look at uh, no reasonable belief, we look at uh, recklessness, um, and we look at knowledge. Um, but uh, we ultimately come down on uh, does not reasonably believe. Uh, next slide, please. The other aspect of that uh, chapter on fault is to look at additional intent elements. One of the most consistent messages we heard from uh, both operational stakeholders and victims during the pre-consultation period was that the additional intent element in the existing intimate image abuse offenses makes it very difficult to bring prosecutions, either because there isn't evidence of the defendant's uh, purpose uh, or motive, or because the defendant's purpose or motive wasn't what the statute requires. So for instance, uh, it wasn't a sexual motive for voyeurism or it wasn't intent to cause distress for the so-called revenge porn offense, uh, the disclosing private sexual images offense. So we've uh, decided to propose a base offense with no additional intent element uh, in order to deal with that issue, but we still feel there's a role for more serious offenses with additional intent elements because of the greater culpability attached uh, where there is um, such additional intent. So in this offense, uh, it would be an offense for a person intentionally to take or share an intimate image of V where V does not consent and D does so with the intention of humiliating, alarming or distressing the victim. Uh, we don't have a no reasonable belief in consent element here because we don't think a reasonable belief in consent is consistent with an intention to cause uh, humiliation, alarm, or distress. Next slide, please. And the final additional intent element is um, uh, intent or purpose to obtain sexual gratification. Um, so in this one, again, similar uh, structure to the, the last two, it's an offense for the defendant intentionally to take or share an intimate image of V. If V does not consent, uh, the defendant does not reasonably believe that uh, V consents and D does so with the intention that they or a third person will, for the purpose of obtaining sexual gratification, look at the image. So you may recognize some of that language from the voyeurism and upskirting uh, offenses in the Sexual Offenses Act. Um, our final offense um, is the threats offense. Um, those of you who've been following the debates about the domestic abuse bill will know that there has um, been a huge debate in parliament about whether to add uh, a threatening to share private sexual images offense to the existing disclosure of private sexual images offense in the 2015 Criminal Justice and Courts Act. Um, this offense is effectively designed to do um, what has been discussed in parliament, but to be much broader. So it's not limited to a kind of domestic abuse context. Um, so it, it's a fairly uh, simple uh, offense to set out. It's an offense for a defendant to threaten to share an intimate image of V where either D uh, intends to cause V to fear that the threat will be carried out or D is reckless as to whether V will fear that the threat will be carried out. Um, so those are our four offenses. I think I've got just two more slides. The next one is on ancillary orders. So um, perhaps the uh, second most uh, important message that we heard from stakeholders during our pre-consultation engagement is that the lack of lifetime anonymity um, automatically for victims of the offense, uh, the, the disclosing private sexual images without consent offense uh, in section 33 of the CJCA 2015 um, is, uh, prevents uh, victims from coming forward and prevents them from continuing to participate in prosecutions. Uh, so we are recommending that for all victims of these uh, offenses, there should be automatic lifetime anonymity. Similarly, that there should be sort of automatic uh, eligibility for special measures at trial. Um, one of the reasons why we have proposed a separate sexual gratification offense is because we think it uh, 
uh, makes it easier to identify when notification is appropriate and when a sexual harm prevention order might be uh, might need to be considered. Um, so uh, we're suggesting similar to the voyeurism and upskirting offenses that notification, um, in other words, a requirement uh, to um, be on the sexual offense offenders register uh, will apply automatically uh, for the sexual gratification offense when an appropriate seriousness threshold is met. And we anticipate that would probably be similar to the seriousness threshold for the voyeurism and upskirting offenses. Uh, and similarly, sexual harm prevention orders would be available where necessary to protect the public uh, from sexual harm. My final slide is the defense. Uh, this is a defense that we think is uh, necessary because we've proposed a base offense without any additional intent element. So because it's possible to commit this offense without a sort of um, malign intention, we need to identify circumstances where actually the defendant has a good reason for taking or sharing an intimate image without consent. And we've tried to do that, um, but this is a non-exhaustive list. So we've identified what we think are the main categories of case where it might be necessary to take or share an intimate image uh, of someone without consent, uh, but we, we, we're not suggesting that we think we've identified every possible case. This would be a, a flexible defense of reasonable excuse. And we'd be particularly interested to hear from you whether you think we've missed anything or whether you think um, uh, this sort of covers most of the grounds that might be needed in terms of a defense uh, for our provisionally proposed offenses. Uh, that's all I want to say for now. Um, uh, we're very happy to take questions um, from all of you. I'm going to hand over now to Nadia Manzor, who is, as I mentioned, the lead lawyer on this project, who's going to explain uh, the definition of an intimate image. Um, introduce you as the lawyer at the Law Commission leading the Intimate Image Abuse Project. Um, you've been seconded to the Law Commission. You've got a breadth and depth of expertise in the criminal justice system. You previously worked at the Upper Tribunal, but prior to that, you worked for 15 years as a senior legal advisor in Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire. Um, and you also um, worked as a legal advisor and researcher to Howard Riddle, who was the then senior district judge of England and Wales. Um, and you work together on a number of criminal justice projects. So thank you very much for joining us, Nadia. And would you like to um, explain to us where you have explored and got to on the definition and nature of intimate images? Thanks very much, Kate. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so just uh, putting forward our provisional proposals in relation to the definition of image and the definition of intimate. Um, in so far as the definition of image is concerned, our provisional proposals that we've put forward um, define this as uh, photographs or, or videos. Um, and we've built on this from the existing disclosure offence, the Section 33 disclosure offence, which provides quite a detailed definition of image. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the upskirting and voyeurism provisions, you will note that those provisions don't define image beyond simply saying that it must be a recording. Um, so for the purposes of the disclosure offence um, within Section 33, uh, photographs or films are defined as anything that is a still or moving image. Uh, what it doesn't include uh, are altered images, um, in particular for the purposes of uh, uh, narrowing the scope of definition of intimate, it doesn't cover the disclosure offence, doesn't cover drawings, for example. And we've agreed with the parameters of this and in our consultation paper we've also said that sexual drawings, paintings and sculptures, for example, shouldn't fall within the scope of intimate image abuse. Um, this is firstly because we didn't hear any evidence that there was consensus on this being wrongful or harmful behaviour. Uh, we recognised, uh, secondly, that we recognise the need for artistic expression and also we've noted that no other jurisdiction defines image so broadly. 
Uh, so for the purposes of our pro provisional proposals, we say that images should include photographs or videos and videos. Um, and this certainly uh, lines us with a number of other jurisdictions that have specific intimate image abuse offences or laws, in particular Australia, Canada, New Zealand and Scotland. Moving on then to the definition of intimate, uh, many of you who've read the consultation paper or the summary will be aware that there is an inconsistency in the current legal framework um, and it, no, it, it should be noted that there are certain images that are not covered. So, for example, upskirting is covered under the Voyeurism, um, under Section 67 of the Sexual Offences Act, but down blousing is not. Um, similarly, where Section 33, the disclosure offence, requires the image to be both private and sexual and not of a kind ordinarily seen in public, and the voyeurism offence requires it to be a private act with a reasonable expectation of privacy, this means that certain images taken in public settings would be excluded. Um, and some of the examples that we've touched upon in the consultation paper are, for example, uh, a person breastfeeding in public, um, uh, taking or sharing an uh, image of a rape or sexual assault in a public place, and someone who appears nude or semi-nude against their will in a public place. Um, the scope of the current uh, disclosure and voyeurism provisions means that it doesn't cover images that are intimate within particular religious groups, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. And it also doesn't cover altered images that uh, depict the person in a sexual or nude or semi-nude state. So when we've looked at developing our definition of what intimate should cover, We've not only looked at the existing provisions in England and Wales, but we've also considered the intimate image abuse laws in Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Scotland. And following our meetings in the pre-consultation stage with a number of stakeholders, uh, what we've uh, come up with is that intimate should have essentially three categories. You'll see on the slide we've said that uh, sexual would cover something that a reasonable person would consider to be sexual because of its nature or taken as a whole, a reasonable person would consider it to be sexual. What we've done here is essentially to separate out nude and semi-nude from the concept of uh, sexual, which is within the existing provisions. Um, and that's largely because we heard from some stakeholders that uh, nude or semi-nude images of themselves are not necessarily sexual. Um, and those uh, sexual images would be caveated with the test of not of a kind ordinarily seen in public, so as to exclude images as in the current provisions of somebody kissing or hugging, for example, because those are acts that you do ordinarily see in public. Uh, moving on then to nude and semi-nude. Um, our definition in the consultation paper and summary uh, document uh, will demonstrate that what we've said at the moment is that this should cover exposed genitals, buttocks and breasts, and this would essentially cover nude images. It would also cover genitals, buttocks and breasts covered with an underwear, so this would essentially be semi-nude images. And this um, builds on the existing voyeurism and upskirting provisions and aligns us with uh, the definitions uh, that have been adopted by other jurisdictions in Australia, for example, and New Zealand. Um, in order to cover down blousing, we do state that the concept of intimate would need to be broadened slightly to cover exposed or partially exposed breasts, whether covered by underwear or not, um, taken down uh, the depicted person's top. Um, we also say that uh, the nude or semi-nude images would be caveated with not of a kind ordinarily seen in public which essentially means that uh, the male chest or prepubescent chest would not fall within the definition of intimate images, i.e. nude or semi-nude. Uh, but it would still allow down blousing and upskirting to be covered within the provisional proposals. Um, we also note that the definition uh, includes in, should include images that have been edited to appear not nude or semi-nude. And this is, for example, where um, emojis are, are used to cover the breast area or black strips are used to cover the intimate parts of uh, uh, the depicted person. And what we've essentially said in the consultation paper is that um, anything that covers the depicted person 
or sorry, it, it covers them in a, in a way that an underwear would should be covered within the definition of nude or semi-nude. Um, we also say that the definition should include images where the victim is not immediately identifiable, um, just as it does for upskirting provisions. So, for example, where a person's face has been cropped out, this would still be covered if there's some sort of other identifiable feature. And the reason we say that is firstly, it aligns with the upskirting provisions, and this is an evidential matter for the police in any event. Um, the third category then is private. Um, these are would essentially include remaining images that are not sexual, nude or semi-nude. Uh, they are labelled private and they've been essentially taken from the existing voyeurism provisions and specifically at the moment include using the toilet. Uh, we've noted that the Australian states incorporate a much broader concept which uh, f uh, look at a state of undress showering and bathing and we've asked for consultees views um, as to whether or not such images should also be included in the definition of intimate. The final two uh, categories that I'm going to very briefly speak about are altered images and images that are intimate within particular religious groups. Um, in our consultation paper we've stated that for the purposes of uh, a taking offence um, altered images wouldn't be covered because you can't take an altered image, you make an altered image. Um, and essentially the evidence that we've heard is that um, from in, during the pre-consultation phase is that it is predominantly the sharing of those altered images that um, causes an, uh, wrongs and harms to, to the depicted individual. Um, as you many of you will be aware, the current disclosure offence uh, under section 33 uh, does not cover uh, for example, deep fake uh, pornography, nor a sexualized photoshopping. Um, and this was based uh, sadly on a misconception back in 2015 that such images do not cause harm to the depicted person. Um, and as you will see in our consultation paper, we've given a, a lot of evidence that focuses on the wrongful behavior and harmful behavior that's caused uh, from altered images. Um, the so, for example, we spoke to or had a, an interview transcript by a victim survivor by the name of Gibby, who was a victim of um, uh, deep fakes. And I'll go on to very briefly explain sexualized photoshopping and deep fakes in a moment. And what she said was that um, those images that had been taken of her and then manipulated or altered uh, as under the deep fake um, uh, uh, technology, it took her a long time to keep doing the things that she loved um, and she's learning to adjust and so and so that she can feel safe going out in public. She said it influenced every part of her life, where she lives, what she does, how she acts and she said that despite her being quite a strong and resilient individual, the experience or being a victim of those deep fake um, images was not only stressful but deeply traumatising. Um, so at the moment, the two forms of altered images that we're aware of are sexualized photoshopping and deep fake pornography. Um, and the consultation paper describes those in detail. And we know that neither of those are covered within the existing uh, disclosure offence. Um, what's interesting is that altered images are covered in other jurisdictions. So, for example, they're covered um, in at least seven Australian states. Um, Scotland and Virginia also cover altered images. Um, for the purposes of the sharing and distribution offence. We heard evidence from an expert in this field, Henry Adler, who is a, research, uh, a researcher and expert in deepfake uh, technology, that in 2019, almost 14,000 deepfakes were made, 96% of them were pornographic, and 100% of those uh, depicted were women. And again, 100% of those were uploaded onto pornographic um, websites. Um, so the impact and long lasting harms are, tr are truly um, devastating for these victims. Uh, the last uh, group uh, or sort of uh, category of images that I'm going to talk about are those uh, that are intimate within particular religious groups. We heard from a number of stakeholders how certain intimate images are utilised and weaponised against victims from particular religious groups. Uh, so, for example, a Muslim woman with um, in a private setting, exposing her bare shoulders without her hijab, sitting with a man who may or may not be her husband. Um, and these victims have repeatedly reported feeling violated, exposed, 
humiliated, ostracized, harassed, and then sometimes even physically harmed. Um, when the Scottish government developed their uh, disclosure offences, uh, they certainly consulted on this point about broadening the definition of intimate. And there were over 79% of consultees who favoured broadening the definition of intimate to include those types of images. And again, when we spoke to the eSafety Commission in Australia, they said that there was uh, overwhelming support for the need to protect victims from such abuse, but at the time they felt it was appropriate to draw that into their civil regime rather than the criminal framework. Um, but we acknowledge in the consultation paper that any such um, behaviour or conduct would be limited to circumstances where the perpetrator knew that those images would be considered to be intimate to that particular uh, depicted person. Uh, with that, uh, I close and I'm going to hand it over to Kate so that she can introduce Rosie. Thank you very much. Um, that was extremely helpful, Nadia, and we, I'm sure, will have questions for you shortly. But now, um, as you say, we are going to turn to Rosie. Rosie Peck is a research assistant at the Law Commission working on the Intimate Image Abuse Project. She started her career as a family law barrister before moving into criminal justice reform, working for non-profit organisations here and in the US before joining the civil service. She has broad experience of working in criminal justice, including working for the Louisiana Center for Children's Rights, the Louisiana Capital Assistance Center, and the Independent Office for Police Conduct. So thank you, Rosie. You are going to talk to us now about the public space test, I understand. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the public element tests that have um, formed part of our provisional proposals. The bulk of the behaviour, um, as we understand it, that happens in intimate image abuse is um, the sharing of images that are taken um, or shared of privately. So images that have been taken in a private setting or have been shared between um, two individuals who know each other and the onward sharing and the harm that's experienced from those private images. Where there's a, a public element to those images, there's a question over whether those need the same level of protection so, for example, an image of something uh, taken of something that occurred in public or the sharing of an image that has previously been made available in public. And we've heard that these are offered less harmful behaviours. They're not as wrongful and there's a lower level of culpability. Therefore, they doesn't always warrant criminalisation. And this is recognised in the existing offences in the voyeurism and, and in other jurisdictions. And so we... Um, look to develop a test that would carve out those minimal harmful behaviours so that they wouldn't be criminalised. So starting with images that are taken in a public setting. First, we considered images that wouldn't necessarily require protection of the criminal law. And the way um, we looked, considered images of a naked protester, or a streaker at a football game, and we didn't really hear any evidence that there was significant harm attached to the taking or sharing of those sorts of images because of the public nature of the um, intimate act that's been depicted. We then identified five types of images that we do want to protect under these offences, and they are images of sexual assault that occurs in public, where someone is nude or semi-nude against their will in public, and upskirting and down-blousing photos, which often happen in public. And there's a non-voluntariness to these types of images or to the act that's being portrayed in these types of images that has a potential to cause real significant harm to the person who's in them. The two final examples that we considered are images of breastfeeding and images of someone nude or semi-nude in a public changing space. And these are more private acts. And there is sometimes an element of choice in the fact that they're being done publicly, or sometimes it's out of necessity. And we considered that um, those images should people who are conducting those acts in public do still retain an expectation of privacy against an image of them being taken whilst doing them. So we arrived at the reasonable expectation of privacy test which is here upon the screen and so we provisionally proposed that where an intimate image is taken or shared without consent and the intimate image is taken in a place to which members of the public have access and that the victim is, or the defendant reasonably believes the victim is, voluntarily engaging in a sexual or private act 
or is voluntarily nude or semi-nude. Under both of those circumstances, the defendant would not have committed an offence unless the victim has a reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to the taking of the image. So the reasonable expectation of privacy test, there are variations of it in the voyeurism offence and in other jurisdictions. And we heard evidence that it's a well understood test and it has the flexibility to consider the range of behaviours that sit between the examples that we've given. We didn't want to make the test solely dependent on the place that the um, image is taken. It's also about the circumstances of the act that's being portrayed in the image. The test as it's designed there applies to both taking and sharing offences, but it only looks at the um, circumstances that the image was taken. And you can see in section B there that we've built in a voluntariness to the um, sexual act or the nude or semi-nude in public. And that's important because the, the non-voluntary examples that we talked about, the sexual assault in public and being nude or semi-nude against um, persons will, we don't believe it's necessary that they should have to then prove that they've retained a reasonable expectation of privacy in those circumstances. Um, we would also, in terms of the, the final two examples that we gave, the breastfeeding or the, um, public, or the nude in the public changing room, we would we have uh, provisionally proposed that that would be included in uh, explanatory notes, for example, that we would expect that those two examples um, would retain a reasonable expectation of privacy. So that's how we've suggested that we can ensure that they retain protected. Moving on to images that have been previously shared in public, the sharing offence we set out earlier includes all sharing, including secondary distribution. So whether an image has been shared for the first time or for the 50th time, our sharing offence would capture it. But sharing an image that has already been available in public is often quite a different act. It's also very common behaviour. If we think, for example, of images that are shared on Instagram of someone who's semi-nude or commercial porn sites or magazines even, the resharing of those images is incredibly common. We consider the behaviours where the level of harm and culpability associated with that type of behaviour isn't sufficient to warrant criminalisation. And the two key aspects that um, we considered in those examples that made secondary distribution at the lower end of the harmful scale are when the image had been shared in public and where it had been done so consensually with the person depicted. And that's how we arrived at the limbs of these tests. So the test here is that where an intimate image has been shared without consent and the intimate image has or the defendant reasonably believe, believes the image has previously been shared in the place to which members of the public have access and either the person depicting the image consented to that sharing or the defendant reasonably believes that the person depicted consented to that sharing and under those circumstances the defendant would not have committed an offence. So in this um, test, public would apply equally, whether it's online or offline. Um, it would be fact dependent as to whether it's a public or private place. And how public an online space is can be really variable. I think of sort of the, the types of forums that people might post or share photos in. They can be open to a very large number of people or a very, very small closed group of people. And as far as we understand, how public certain online forums are seen as public or private has not been specified in law and therefore it, there is the flexibility within this test to allow for consideration of those facts in each case. We've attached a reasonable belief element to both of these limbs to ensure that the right level of culpability is captured. Um, we consider that it's important that if someone believes that the facts, reasonably believes that the facts are a certain way, they have the same level of culpability as if those facts were the same way. That's why we wanted to reflect that in these tests. In particular, the, the reasonable part of that is important um, when we're considering the consent of the person um, who to the previous sharing, because this requires the defendant to turn their mind to the question of consent. We didn't think that it was satisfactory to rely on the availability of an image in public to claim a belief in consent where the caption that's associated with the image or the video or the nature of the act that's being portrayed would quite clearly suggest that there was no consent. So that's sort of a brief outline of those two tests and we'll be really interested to hear your thoughts on those later on in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. We are now going to turn to three 
defence practitioners all based here at Garden Court Chambers who are going to give some views and perspectives on the proposals that you've set out. We're going to first turn to Tom Rainwright, who is a criminal defence barrister specialising in, amongst other areas, criminal appeals. Um, he does have an incredibly broad practice and he has, alongside his um, impressive practice in, in other areas such as protest work, developed a expertise in <clears throat> this area. He acted for the appellant in R.V. Bassett, which is currently the leading case on the offence of voyeurism, and has also acted in a number of other appeals defining the law relating to sexual offences, including the case of R.V. Gu on what constitutes a disorderly house, and R.V. McNally on when deception negates consent. Tom is going to discuss the new definition of intimate image as set out in chapter six of the con I'm not sure whether hi Tom hi sorry I think we just um or well, certainly I just lost you a moment there Kate sorry I didn't want to interrupt um thank you very much uh so I just wanted to start by saying one of the great things about uh, that I love about the, the Law Commission is the scope of the ambition of their projects uh, to impose uh, sometimes over existing laws that go back hundreds of years in a sort of patchwork fashion, some sort of structure and coherence and consistent principles running through them, rather than responding in the sort of ad hoc way uh, that much of our legislation is, is fashioned according to the whim of the uh, politicians. Um, and I think the, uh, that's one of the, the great things. And I think one of the difficulties that the Law Commission runs into, and which brings me on to the first observation of this project, is the that they're limited by the scope that they're given. Um, because in terms of the definition of these new offences, uh, they are intended, uh, as Penny said, to replace the existing um, voyeurism and, and other uh, offences. I have to declare a vested interest because I, as I say, uh, as Kate said in the introduction, dealt with the case of Bassett, which is at the moment the leading authority on voyeurism. And if it gets replaced, it, it won't be in articles anymore. It was my first appeal against conviction. So I've been, uh, I have to declare a vested interest. But the, the question I've got is whether it would replace uh, voyeurism, because voyeurism isn't just about the taking of images, recording of photographs or videos. It, it's about the observation as well um, and simply ob observing, uh, which wouldn't be covered by the current definition as uh, enacted. Uh, there may be um, that there is good reason to separate out the recording uh, aspect from the observation aspect uh, of those offences. But the question is then going to be whether or not that's going to lead to differences uh, in terms of the definitions that are used as to what is an, an intimate image in, in this offence and what is uh, captured by the uh, voyeurism offence and whether there are going to be new inconsistencies uh, created, as I say, potentially outside the scope of the Law Commission's um, uh, project, but uh, something that may need to be uh, considered uh, at a later stage, uh, perhaps amending the voyeurism offence to come into line uh, with the, any new offence. Um, the second thing as well that comes alongside, the, that's the vision of um, redefining uh, the law, is having to make sure that the definitions are right. Um, because I think quite often, and particularly in this case, uh, the, everyone knows, or one thinks, everyone knows what it is that we want to uh, include. The definition, the difficulty is putting that into, into words to make sure that we capture um, not too much and not too little um, of, of what we want to. And it's really important because it, it's an important part of the rule of law that it, it is clear and can be understood and people know what is a criminal offence uh, and what isn't. Um, and what is obvious and common sense to one person, uh, and you may think, well, of course, the CPS wouldn't charge that, that doesn't always follow. 
Um, and so where possible, um, it's important those definitions are uh, precise. And it's not possible to reduce all human behavior to a uh, set of, of rules. And so it's not always possible to deal with it. And that's why we have uh, courts and juries to decide whether evidence uh, falls into one category or, or another. Um, but the definition needs to be accurate. And so just by way of example, uh, the proposed uh, definition in relation to down blousing, of course, that behavior which should be captured, the question is whether or not the current definition is too um, ambiguous, uh, because the proposal is that it would uh, in include in semi-nude, partially exposed breasts, whether or not covered with underwear, taken down the depicted person's top. And it's not entirely clear uh, what taken down the depicted person's top uh, would mean. Um, and there's an ambiguity, particularly when that's coupled with, for the basic offence, the lack of intent, no intention to, to humiliate. Would it cover pictures taken uh, by someone uh, of a person who is sat down or taken by someone who's uh, taller than the person who's in the photograph? Um, and whether or not it may cover people who are in the background of the photograph, uh, not the intended target. There is the uh, proviso, the, the saving provision or defence, that it's, uh, the images are not, um, or the offence is not designed to include uh, images or behaviour uh, of someone in public. But then there's a question as to whether that would go too far the other way. Um, in terms of providing too, too much of a defence and effectively negate uh, the, the down blousing offence, sort of cutting it off at the knees. It's difficult, I think, I don't know necessarily what the answer is. It may be uh, that the, it's a problem caused by having the basic offence without the, the additional mens rea, the aggravating factors. Um, but I think it's a difficulty which is because it's, it's simply quite difficult to define in, the, in a way which you don't get uh, in relation to upskirting, uh, which can be defined by reference to what would otherwise not be ordinarily visible. Um, so that's one um, issue which may need uh, grappling with. And then the third and, and final thing I was just going to raise was the discussion in the paper, which is quite interesting, um, as to whether it should include images where the victim's not identifiable. And I think, although generally that's, uh, there isn't uh, in, in many offences uh, any sort of set rule as to whether or not there needs to be a victim there and at court or identifiable, um, what it would mean in this case is it would be a matter of interpretation, uh, whether or not the person depicted was consenting uh, to the to the image, and sometimes that may not be a difficulty, particularly if the person is uh, who makes the image is caught red-handed. But it doesn't just include making the images; it can include sharing the images, which may be a number of steps removed uh, from the original uh, creation. And there may be images which are designed to look like voyeurism, but in fact aren't. Um, what one person may reasonably believe to be staged or, or mock up and another may not um, and the harm if we go back to what the harm is of these offences it, it comes from there being a victim who is aware that their image has been taken and, and is out there and so it may be that in fact there, there, sh there should be um, some sort of uh, requirement uh, that there is a, a victim uh, not necessarily identifiable uh, by virtue of, of the image, it may be that no one else could tell it was that particular person other than the person themselves, the person depicted. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that simply because uh, people would be able to get around it by uh, blacking out the faces or, or anything like that. Um, but whether uh, where it's not possible to say who the victim is or uh, have any statement from them to say that they were not consenting, um, that raises some concerns as to whether you may end up in some circumstances of having a person convicted uh, of these offences where, in fact, uh, the person depicted did consent. Um, it is not necessarily easily, uh, easy for the defence to find out, certainly.
um, but whether the burden should be on them is a, is a different question. So um, as I was coming back to uh, what I said in opening, this fantastic uh, project with great scope and, and ambition, um, but we have to make sure that the lines are drawn in, in the right place. And that's why it's so important that particularly the defence community uh, get involved and uh, e examine this carefully and, and give the benefit of their experience and, uh, and opinions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. And we will be having a Q&A at the end. So if anybody is on this webinar and has a burning question, they can drop it in the Q&A now. Um, and a reminder that um, this is a um, process where the Law Commission has very much an open mind about their proposals and they are asking for um, the defence community to engage with the proposals because they are open to changing them and adapting them in response to the um, observations that may be made by either the defence community or other stakeholders in this process. Um, and we will remind you in, at the end how you can re respond to the consultation because it does matter how many people respond and it, it makes a difference if um, the same view is expressed by um, more, more individuals. Which gives us now the opportunity to turn to another aspect of um, the, the proposed legislation, how it may impact a particular group of people. We're going to um, be addressed by Jo Cecil. Jo oh, is... I'm so sorry for interrupting. I, I, I don't know if it makes a difference whether I go before or after Jo. I, I wonder if it doesn't make a difference. I'm slightly concerned I'm at court um, and if I'm here for too much longer, I may get locked in. <laughs> We definitely don't want you locked in. So um, Jo is shortly going to talk to us about how these um, new offences may particularly impact children. But as Abby says, she is, um, Abigail Beish is in court and she's um, just finished court for the day. So she is going to be talking to us um, about mens rea. She's an experienced defence advocate, but she runs this practice a long time side her international human rights, environmental crime and practice and her regularly her practice regularly appearing in military courts. She has particular expertise, expertise in representing defendants with learning difficulties and mental health, health problems and has represented defendants facing indecent images cases. So she is um, particularly um, experienced and able to make some helpful observations on the new proposed mens rea in relation to these new offences. So thank you, Abby. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry, uh, Joe, for jumping in front of you. It's much appreciated. Um, now, uh, as Kate has just set out, what I want to try and just look at is the, the quite narrow point uh, about the mens rea on these offences. And I, um, I have been asked to keep my talk to a, a, a sort of a minimum of three minutes. So I'll do my best because it's obviously a, a very, very wide uh, issue, but I, I note that there was a question, I think it was question 25, saying that the Law Commission provisionally proposes that any offence of taking or sharing intimate images without consent should have a fault requirement um, that the defendant intends to take or share an image uh, without reasonably believing in the victim's consent. And that's what's being um, floated at the moment as being the base offence and that there may be um, further offences thereafter that have a specific intent requirement, the more, more serious offences. Um, so looking firstly at that base offence that's being suggested, um, without reasonable belief and consent certainly aligns itself um, with the other um, offences in the Sexual Offences Act. Um, but it should be borne in mind um, that where there uh, is an offence without reasonable belief and consent within the Sexual Offences Act, that it usually is accompanied um, by a sexual act. Um, so there is necessarily an intent element uh, as well. Um, I have looked at uh, what's been suggested by way of the intent elements for the more serious offences. I think they're extremely sensible um, suggestions. And there's effectively uh, four main areas. So either intent for the purposes of humiliating, alarming or distressing the victim or for the purposes of sexual gratification or for financial gain or for um, co effectively coercive control over the victims. Um, 
So those at the moment are being suggested in addition to the base offence to make a more serious uh, offence. Um, but uh, I would have some concerns about simply leaving it as only um, a reasonable belief in consent. So there are examples, I'll just use an extreme example, of where that may be too wide um, and where the culpability um, it may be uh, uh, effectively a stretch too wide is when, for example, you've got two, uh, two women at the beach, two sisters, one of them gets knocked over in a wave and emerges bedraggled um, at having a, a intimate parts of their body on display. Sister takes a picture and sends it to their mother. Um, now, there's no um, reasonable belief in consent in that scenario of the picture being taken, but clearly there's no intention to cause any alarm uh, or distress. Um, I would suggest that the same applies if that same photograph is sent not to their mother, but to a, a mutual friend of theirs um, that they are that's trusted and well known, and it's sent um, for the purposes of saying this is a funny photograph, etc. And I will come back to that um, uh, uh, pictures being taken because people find them funny and, and how problematic that's going to be with intent. Um, but I suspect what will be a more familiar example and one that the courts could well be inundated with if we just have a base offence uh, where there's just lack of reasonable belief and consent is going to be people uh, heavily intoxicated on a night out. Um, taking photographs, a girl, for example, a group of girls on the night out, one of them publicly urinates, the other one takes a photograph and shares it to the WhatsApp group that they are all on. So all the girls that can see it as she urinates in public are the same girls on the WhatsApp group, but the picture invariably has been taken without consent, has been shared without consent. It's just not been shared with any intention of harm or distress. Um, and that is going to apply to public nudity, um, women, uh, for example, exposing breasts or men ex exposing any of their intimate parts whilst heavily intoxicated. And that also brings us on to the issue when it comes to consent. Um, firstly, that the nature of the way in which these pictures are likely to be taken, they're taken almost contemporaneously. So it's very difficult um, for any thought process at all really to be given to consent until after the image is taken. Um, that doesn't apply so much to sharing, but it does to the taking of the images. And of course, the um, obvious difficulties that will always be there with issues of consent where uh, the individual is heavily intoxicated. Um, so there is, uh, I think it's important to look at those scenarios where there could be um, voluntary public nudity whilst heavily intoxicated and, and how that is treated um, by this base offence. And also Rosie's um, very helpful talk about um, public place um, images and how those are treated. So the question in uh, 34 is to the fact that it is proposed to avoid criminalising um, those images where, um, for example, they are in a place where the public has access and how that varies to somebody exposing themselves in a public place and, and how that intention is going to be balanced in those different areas. Um, so that would just be um, one concern that I would raise. But I, I do note uh, what's been said about, for example, making the offence too narrow. And I think this is at paragraphs 1046 of 49 of the, um, of the paper. Um, and that was certainly uh, pointing out difficulties, for example, where upskirting um, is laughed off. Um, boys take a, some photographs. It's not done for sexual gratification. But it's done because they find it funny. Um, and that those kinds of offences, um, I know there is concern, would not be caught by this act if, um, if the intention element needed to be proved. And I, I recognise those concerns. Um, and I think that they probably can still be dealt with, but I, but it, it has to be balanced against, as I, all of those concerns have got to be balanced against um, the ruinous effects of a criminal conviction of this nature, particularly in circumstances where this is going to be an offence that will um, be seen rightly or wrongly as a sexual offence and which will also carry with it a, a particular type of, of stigma. Um, but I would be very concerned about casting the net too wide when it comes to intent for the reasons that, that I've set out. So uh, in my view, the base offence um, should carry an element of intent and, and it could even be instead of the consent element. Um, it's impossible to envisage any circumstances where the defendant has intended distress, um, but still reasonably believes in the consent of the person that the image is being taken from. So 
Um, the fault requirement can be, of course, intent or consent. But my preference, in fact, would be intent um, over consent. And where the um, intent is being suggested for the purposes of humiliation, along with distressing the victim um, or um, sorry, uh, for alarm or distress. I mean, there, there could be an added element, for example, such as uh, or being reckless as to whether such an effect would be caused. And that um, requirement then of recklessness um, would have the added need. You'd have to prove that the defendant perceived that there was such a risk. So all those examples I gave of friends on nights out and clearly having no uh, ill intentions at all, um, would be able to show that they didn't have a uh, perceived risk of any distress, but it would catch all those cases that were being discussed about upskirting um, and boys, for example, taking pictures because they found it funny that they would be caught by the act. So I think just a little bit more thought um, is required in relation to um, the base offence not being too wide, um, because as I say at the moment, my concern would be that we would be inundated with these drunken pictures in friends' WhatsApp groups taken on a night out at stag do, et cetera, that kind of thing, and that the um, criminalization would be uh, too wide. Um, so that's where I'm going to stop, uh, uh, but I'm very happy to answer any questions as long as I haven't been locked in court. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll um, keep an eye on you. We'll raise the alarm if we see anybody behind you. And so finally, we're going to turn to Joe. Um, we've heard some broad observations about the um, definition of intent as proposed in the consultation. Now we're going to look at the impact on a particular group of potential defendants. So Joe Jo Cecil is an award-winning criminal defence and public law barrister. She has a strong appellate practice, both domestically and internationally, appearing at all levels, including the Supreme Court. Um, she has and is renowned for her expertise in representing children. Um, she has been instructed in many of the recent test cases relating to children in the criminal justice system, some which have resulted in significant changes in the law. Most recently, she acted for Just for Kids Law in the case of RVTI, which is now the leading High Court case on intermediaries for children. So we now turn to Joe, who is going to look at how they impact children. Um, thank you, Kate. Um, I'm obviously, and it will come as no great surprise, going to pick up on some of the themes that Abby has already mentioned in relation to potential um, disproportionality in terms of impact and the wide ranging um, catch all that could take place. But firstly, before I turn to that, can I think one thing that is important to note from the Law Commission paper and really deserves proper recognition is that the Law Commission has adopted the definition of children as being those aged under 18, so the international definition, and that is significant in itself. And it then also turns to look at um, young people in addition to that, so those aged between 18 to 24, a category that we've more recently seen reflected um, more broadly within the approach of the appellate courts and now within the criminal courts themselves with regard to sentencing and approaches to maturity. So I'm just going to very briefly, if I may, concentrate on children in relation to this aspect, um, specifically mainly because of their age and their developmental maturity. And it's notable that within the consultation, there is a decision not to exclude children from, li from liability for these types of offences in relation to intimate images and the sharing. And that is primarily um, justified on the basis of the potential for children to, have, um, to cause harm themselves, quite significant harm on occasion, um, and indeed consistency with, other, uh, with others' legislation, although they do note concerns are raised regarding over-criminalisation. And that's really what I want to touch upon now, because there is plainly a tension in any event between children and young people being in need of protection. And that's made um, apparent from much research that demonstrates that children are disproportionately often affected by these types of offences. Um, and are often victims of sharing images without consent, but also that children are frequently some of those that do share images 
and often without consent. And so we have that in that, that natural, unfortunate tension that arises there. Um, and so perhaps I suppose the most useful approach to looking at this area of intimate image and sharing is to consider the impact on children of the current legislation as it relates to indecent images of children and the sharing or making and distribution of those because those because the proposals within the current consultation necessarily um, expand that range of criminal liability that affixes in such circumstances. And the consultation paper very helpfully reviews some of the research I and mean, certainly in relation to context, as we all know, and indeed it's, it's reflected to some extent within the paper itself, from a practitioner experience, sharing images of all natures um, is widespread within children and young people. Um, it may be considered to be something of a different time with the advent of various apps, live chats, games in which various images are shared. The problem's significant and it's widespread. And it perhaps... It's instructive just to look very briefly at some of the research, just to get a sense of exactly how prevalent it really is. So the NSPCC has conducted um, a fairly significant body of research, um, the most recent one in 2018, slightly updated in 2020. And um, the 2018 research involved 40,000 responses from children aged between seven and 16. Um, primary school the children that were surveyed, one in 20 had been sent a naked or semi-naked image by another person. Secondary school, we see a massive jump again, one in eight had been sent or shown a naked or semi-naked image by another young person. With regard to children admitting sending an image to another young person, it was 3% of primary school children, 4% of secondary school children. Um, so the numbers very quickly add up if you take your average London secondary school with, you know, a thousand kids or so. And you can sort of suddenly start extrapolating how many of these children are potentially caught by either the indecent images legislation or indeed the proposals that are set out within the consultation. Um, they also are children who have sent images to adults. Um, so that's two percent of both primary school children and secondary school age children. Um, half of those that had received a naked image from an adult had also sent the images of themselves. Obviously, where images are being sent to adults, it's a particular concern. And one in 50 children of primary school age had sent an image to an adult. So we can see that on both sides of the equation, there are real concerns. But ultimately, the issues that are surrounding what we we often consider to be sexting and some circumstances with children and the sending of indecent images are often very complex. They're rooted in deep systemic societal issues. Um, they're, really, they're rooted in issues that will result in misogyny and sex, in sexist abuse in relation to children in very paternalistic approaches. Um, it's often the, the concept that um, boys, uh, boys are boys. And certainly when the research was conducted, some boys were found to have up to 30 pictures of different girls on their phones. And anyone that's done a criminal trial will know that there's always the obligatory naked photos when one looks at phone downloads. But in young people, obviously, are living constantly under this threat of having things that they have said or done exposed to massive audiences very, very quickly in some circumstances with WhatsApp groups and other types of um, communication that, frankly, despite having being very heavily involved in relative with with children of primary and secondary school age, I can't keep up. Um, boys often receive credibility for their peers for having these photos on their, on their phones. It's often used as a currency in terms of popularity and the like. And that's really part of the problem. So you have an almost normalization. I'm going to turn in a moment to discuss the actual um, perspectives and, and views of children in regard to the sharing of indecent images. Um, but first, it's perhaps notable to note that children are criminalised frequently already in relation to sending those indecent images of children, um, often unknowingly, unaware that they are. The simple making of an image of themselves and sending it constitutes a criminal offence. And turning to the uh, actual prevalence, um, this is really where, where it behoves a, a really criti a critical eye in relation to the expansion of the laws um, regarding intimate images to apply to children, because in 2016, um, NSPCC research demonstrated that one in six suspects reported to the police for sexual images of children were under 18 years of age. So that's one in six, so a massive disproportionate impact potentially on children. Um, and that's obviously dealing with indecent images, but it has huge implications 
um, where you've got the research that demonstrates that children, as I say, are both disproportionately affected as victims, but also as perpetrators. And so, and with averages of up to 40% of young people being involved in sexting. So this is the type, these are the types of levels that we're actually dealing with here. And the police obviously also have to respond and police these laws. Um, and so the consequences can be extreme indeed, as Abigail has already has already has already pointed to, absolutely catastrophic in some circumstances. Um, Sometimes convictions can result, sometimes cautions can result, even where cautions do not result, and the police instead turn to use their outcome 21 approach, effectively a decision that's in the public interest not to charge, but to record on the police national database. The reality is that these things still are, are, are produced when one looks at the enhanced DBS checks and may result in automatic um, barring from working with children or vulnerable populations ever again. And so these are... These are um, are consequences that can arise from when children are as young as 10 and sharing these images and then follow them throughout their entire lives. And that is a that is a significant issue. And one has to then perhaps put, as I say, cast a very critical eye when one looks at actually what are children's attitudes to this type of offending. The harm, of course, can be significant and can be great, but perhaps the issue is most acutely felt within that base offence. Because the the in, in other studies, um, there have been reports that actually a, a large proportion, the majority of children or young people, teenagers, this was, this was a study in relation to, did not think that images shared without consent were, were shared to cause any level of upset or anything of that nature. 44% of teenagers were aware that they were shared beyond the original recipient. So there's an acceptance of almost of that before it begins. And so the attitudes that children have to the sharing of images are potentially very different to those of, of earlier generations, possibly also because of technology, but also because of the way in which they conduct their relationships, um, which is perhaps a world away from certainly some of ours. And frankly, I'm grateful that Facebook didn't exist when I was 16, 17, 18 and falling out of clubs drunk, as Abby's already explained. Um, but the consequences are significant. And it may be that in reality, um, what needs to happen is ultimately a full impact assessment um, in relation to what impact will these this expansion of criminal of criminality and attaching criminal liability have in relation to children. And secondly, there is a real query um, about the public interest here because unlike. Um, images which are indecent, clearly indecent images of children, where there may well be a strong public interest in essentially having almost a strict liability offence, whether the balance is actually struck correctly in relation to intimate and other images in circumstances where children may be quite disproportionately impacted. And there is a real potential difference in harm where the most serious um, of these types of images is already criminalised. And this by and this the consultation by its very nature must expand the scope of criminal liability. And so you have, as um, to perhaps expand on the examples that Abby's already given, which are fantastic examples, but apply all the more perhaps to, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds, running around playgrounds, doing different things, all of whom have smartphones, all of whom have the ability to take photos in seconds, share them without a second thought, as often is the case, around their friends, on their groups and all the rest of it, because that is the world that they now live in. And it's a very different world to perhaps one that many of us used to live in. And so there is a question as to um, why uh, and or whether it is appropriate for our society to criminalise those children who may well think it's just funny to take photos of nudity obsessed with bare bottoms or whatever it may be, or, you know, even the upskirting and the like, or they all have those smartphones. And so, and secondly, there's a wider, broader societal point, which is why should those children be criminalised when in reality, all of those things are sometimes encouraged as a bit of a joke, even by adults around them. And even when they're not condoned or encouraged and not taken as seriously as perhaps criminalisation might warrant. And so there is, to my mind, um, a little bit of a missed opportunity here, because although one obviously wants consistency within the criminal law, there is an opportunity here to, to, to draw a line of demarcation to explain that actually 
intimate photos are very different potentially to indecent photos of children. And so one has to question whether the balance is actually struck in the right place. And that's something that I certainly would welcome a discussion on. So thank you. That was, um, I'm sure Nadia, Rosie and Penny in there. I haven't seen any questions come into the Q&A yet. Um, I'll allow people a few moments if they do have any questions or you can raise your hand. Oh, well, I, I guess that if I can't see your image, I won't be able to see your hand. Um, I'll I ask a question of, um, of Nadia or, or Rosie or, or Penny, whoever's best place to answer it. Is that OK? Go ahead, Tom. Um, so I was just, it was really just sort of to the, the points that Abby and Joe have, have raised about, uh, and I think it kind of follows on from what I was saying about, you know, we know what sort of images we do want to cover and, you know, some that perhaps we don't. And, and they gave examples, um, the, the nightclubs or the stag do or the sharing amongst uh, friends. And obviously, if it's voluntary nudity in public, there's the defence available uh, that, that Rosie outlined. Um, but example, for example, I, I think just kind of thinking, I think it's important to try and work these things through to see whether it would apply. Um, sort of the almost like 1950s comedy of a, of a man walking uh, out in public and his trousers fall down, um, exposing it, his wife runs. If someone was videoing that and uploaded it, it's sort of thing that could go viral. W would that be captured um, under the proposed uh, definition? Maybe I can uh, start off and then uh, Rosie uh, may want to come in. Um, so uh, first of all, the public space elements are not a defense. They are an element that the prosecution will have to prove when they're sort of triggered. So the defendant might have an obligation might have been a sort of evidential burden to say, you know, I, th I think this was a public place. Um, and in which case the prosecution will have to prove um, that uh, the person depicted had a reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to the taking of the image if the, the other elements are met, so the, the, the voluntariness, et cetera. Um, uh, I mean, I think, I think in some ways the examples Abby gave are easier. Um, I think the beach example there, you know, they're, they're in a public place. Uh, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy on a public beach um, in, in that context. I suppose what's difficult is the sort of accidental nudity. So one's not involuntarily nude, but one isn't, one didn't kind of go out like the streaker right? So one hasn't intentionally become nude in a public place, one has accidentally become nude in, in a public place. Um, and I, th I think that is a sort of the, the challenging boundary. And ultimately, it will be a, a question for the trier of fact, whether, um, w whether the, the elements are met. Um, and, and, you know, I think it will depend on individual factual features that the boundary will be somewhere in the middle there. Um, I, I think my, my instinct would be that in those circumstances where um, the person is in a public place and accidentally is naked, that, um, that probably one doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to that taking in those circumstances, but um, I, I don't think that, uh, that we necessarily want to try and sort of get into the business of enumerating every single possible scenario and what we think the reasonable expectation of privacy test will be. We've tried to kind of set the ends of the spectrum. Um, so where we clearly think there is a reasonable expectation of privacy and where we clearly think there isn't, and then we've said, do we think that the reasonable expectation of privacy test when combined with this voluntariness assessment would do the work here? And ultimately it will be for the courts to work that out, to work out the boundaries, you know, as they did in Bassett, as you well know. Um, so uh, so I, I think there's, there's sort of no easy answer to your question. 
Um, but we think we've identified the right test, which is unsurprising because it's a test that has a, you know, a history within the voyeurism provision. Um, we've, we've simply tried to extract it from being connected to the place in which the picture is taken, um, because we think that that's too narrow an, an inquiry. So in other words, it shouldn't be that you lose your reasonable expectation of privacy just by entering the public space. There should be some more inquiry there to see whether, well, in these circumstances, did you still have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Rosie, I don't know, would you like to add anything? Uh, nothing in particular, just just say in, in that chapter, we do discuss as well sort of the, the range of um, observation and how that links to um, sort of this this concept of when is it more okay to take a photo and when it's not and and people in different circumstances in in public are consenting or you know are aware of sort of a fleeting glance right up to prolonged staring and that's sort of the consideration um of, of this whole scope of of behaviors that could be caught um by an offense and i think that that's um it's just a, a, another element in that chapter to consider that there is a whole range, as, as Penny said, there's very, very clear examples at each end of the spectrum. Um, but all of this, we think, um, sh could be considered by the test that we've proposed. Um, but they're all, they're all aspects to consider when, when looking at the individual cases. Thank you, Penny and Rosie, for those answers. Um, we haven't had any questions which um, doesn't mean that people don't have thoughts that they're beginning to develop but they um, uh, perhaps need more time to distill them. Um, Joe, would you like to add a comment there? You need to come off. Unmute would help wouldn't it? Um, it's more of a it's more of a question it's just picking up on one of the other aspects in the in the um, Law Commission in the full report. There's a reference, and it's been re referred. There's one. There's a single reference within the consultation document, as I as I saw, and then obviously there's been a reference today. But breastfeeding in public um, as being included, and I'm quite I'm quite genuinely quite interested in terms of the rationale behind that, because obviously there's a push to, for normalisation of breastfeeding away from it being seen as something overly intimate. The wrong word, but sexualized or anything of that nature and whether this is sending out that sort of messaging um, and not normalizing it in, in effectively a public place and I'm just interested to know whether there was a specific rationale behind that um, or not because often there's very little that you can actually see of a breast frankly when you're feeding a baby <laughs> and I, I'll share my vested interest in this I've got I've got a tiny baby <laughs> in the background here so I'm genuinely interested in this aspect because it seems to me that it's one of those areas where if you're looking at would somebody consent or not that's highly subjective in reality and um, I wouldn't necessarily have an issue with a picture of me being taken but somebody else would might so you've got that issue floating around so I'm just in it's more of a point of interest than anything else uh, th thanks very much, Joe. Um, so I, I think w we felt that there was a sort of policy position that had been taken in relation to the sort of civil consequences of breastfeeding in the Equality Act that, that we should reflect so that uh, the position is that one does have a reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to breastfeeding, which all it means is if you want to take a picture of a breastfeeding woman, you have to get consent. I mean, that's, that's all it means. It, it doesn't mean it's a, you know, it's, it's a criminal offense to take a photo of a breastfeeding woman. It means it's a criminal offense to take a photo of a breastfeeding woman without getting consent. Thank I don't you. know whether um, uh, Nadia or Rosie want to come in. No, Joe. I mean, essentially, we when we were developing our policy, we wanted to ensure that um, all avenues are appropriately explored. Um, and from uh, if there's any notion that uh, a person who is breastfeeding in public uh, should be excluded, I think we were just trying to be as protective as possible that, that without consent, those images shouldn't be taken. I think I think the the other concern that we had, um, which Nadia's just helpfully reminded me of, is. Um, we thought it might 
well, we, we didn't want there to be a sort of inquiry on a case by case basis, whether individual women who were breastfeeding in public had a reasonable expectation of privacy. So in other words, you know, one could be in all sorts of different places where, and, and one could be at sort of all sorts of different levels of compulsion uh, in relation to breastfeeding. So one could be making a choice where to breastfeed. One might not have such a choice in the circumstances. And we didn't think it would be appropriate to, to say, well, in every case, it will be a, a, a matter, a question of fact, whether or not in these circumstances, this particular person had a reasonable expectation of privacy. We thought that um, the, the presumption should be that one has a reasonable expectation of privacy. That does not, of course, mean that one should breastfeed in private. In, if anything, it's the opposite. It's, it's a, if one does breastfeed in a public place, one still has a reasonable expectation of privacy as against the taking of a photo without consent. And that's all I think we're trying to say. It just, it just froze up, doesn't it? Those difficult, those difficult situations ultimately where I don't know, you're feeding in the background of a picture somewhere at a family event or something of that nature, those types of things. And I, it, it, I just think it's one of those areas where you just see all the different competing issues actually come into, you know, flying into, into focus. Albeit I can't imagine it's going to be a big problem under the legislation generally. I'd be surprised. But it just seemed to me that, that, that there are competing issues there. I mean, I think the, the, the being pictured in the background is an issue that arises across the board in this project. So if you sort of accidentally end up taking a picture of someone breastfeeding, then you haven't intentionally taken an intimate image. You took a picture of the barbecue and you accidentally took an intimate image. So we, we think that the, the fault element will deal with those kind of, well, what's in the background? Or, you know, what if there's someone wearing a low cut top in the background um, well, first of all, you have to be taking the image down the person's top. Uh, and secondly, if they're in the background, then you haven't intentionally taken that as an intimate image. So um, we do think the fault element, that fault element will do some of that work. Thank you, um, Professor Penny Lewis. And that brings us to the end of this webinar we are extremely grateful to all the speakers. Uh, thank you to Tom Wainwright, to Joanne Cecil and to Abigail Beish for their contributions from Garden Court Chambers. But our particular thanks go to Professor Penny Lewis, Nadia Mansour and Rosie Peck from the Law Commission. It is, it's it's um, a huge amount of work and it's self-evident from what you've explained to us today that you've worked diligently and carefully through all of these tangle of issues to try and present some really well thought out proposals. And I will just encourage everybody on this webinar and those who are viewing it after the event to respond to the consultation because they're reliant on defence practitioners to engage with this process, particularly to identify whether there are any gaps in what they are proposing. So thank you so much to everybody watching. Thank you to the speakers and we'll end the webinar now. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone.